Hi folks, in this video we're going to be going through the NCEA Level 1 Science Paper Mechanics for 2019 um, and I'd strongly recommend that you download the paper and work your way through it yourself first um, to identify any areas that um, you know, you're particularly strong in and any areas that you need to work on before going through um, these answers. So for question one, um, a boat's traveling across a lake. Uh, we've been given a speed time graph of its motion um, and it's been split into three sections for us. We're asked to, to describe the motion of the boat during each section of its journey. And so for section A, we've got this line increasing from zero to three meters per second over a time of 400 seconds. Um, because the speed is increasing, we know that it's accelerating. And because the line is straight, we know that that acceleration is constant. So we would say the boat accelerates at a constant rate from zero to three meters per second over 400 seconds. In section B, we've got this horizontal line, meaning that the speed stays at three meters per second. Um, and the time is 700 minus 400, so 300 seconds. So the boat travels at a constant speed of three meters per second for 300 seconds. In the last section, we've got the line decreasing um, from three to zero. And because that's a change in speed or change in velocity, depending on which term you use, um, the, we would say that the object is accelerating or decelerating. In physics, acceleration is a change in speed or velocity. Um, again, that's a distinction that's more important um, at level two and beyond. I'll probably use speed throughout most of this video. Um, the acceleration can be described as both acceleration or deceleration, um, and that's okay. So in section C, the boat accelerates at a constant rate from three to zero meters per second. That's stationary over 100 seconds, so it comes to a stop. Um, it's important to watch out for uh, when we're describing acceleration, we don't say at a constant speed. That's a common mistake that, that I see. Um, and so we would say that the object accelerates at a constant rate. Um, you want to make sure that you're not saying a constant speed because you cannot accelerate at a constant speed. Okay. Uh, not in level one science anyway. And that uh, level of response would be an achieved. Okay, uh, what's the acceleration of the boat in the first 400 seconds? So for this, we need um, this section of the graph, section A. Um, and throughout this video, we're gonna be using the guess method to help us with any calculation questions. Um, so G of guess is what we've been given. Um, the time is 400 seconds. And from the graph, we can see that the change in speed is three minus zero, which is three meters per second. Our unknown is acceleration or A. And for the equation, we would go to the, if we don't know already, we'd go to the um, equations given to us in the, in the exam document. And we would find that A equals the change in velocity or speed over the change in time. That little triangle symbol is delta, it just means change in. And so uh, we substitute in our values, um, giving us three over 400 and pop those into our calculator to solve. And that gives us the acceleration as 0 0.0075 meters per second squared. Um, and that is an achieved level response. In part C, we're asked to explain the acceleration and motion of the boat in section B um, by discussing the horizontal forces acting on it. So uh, we know already that that horizontal line means that it's traveling at a constant speed. Um, that means that there is no acceleration. Um, now, if there's no acceleration, then there can be no unbalanced force acting on the boat. And we should know that from uh, Newton's first and second laws. So as it's traveling at a constant speed, we know that the horizontal forces on it must be balanced, um, meaning that it will not be accelerating. And that means that the net force will be zero or there will be no net force. That can only happen if the forwards force must be the same size as the any force in the opposite direction. Now, I've talked about frictional force here because it means that we can combine um, the term air resistance, which would be acting on the part of the boat that's above the water, as well as water resistance or drag that would be acting on the section of the hull below the water. Um, just using the term friction uh, allows us to account for both of those terms together. So I'm saying that the total frictional force throughout section um, B 
must be the same as the total forwards force and th those forces are opposite in direction. That would be an excellence level response. First, for question D, uh, we need to show that the total distance traveled by the boat is 1,650 meters. Since we've got a speed time graph, uh, we should know that the distance traveled is given by the area under the graph. So we're going to split this up into three sections, uh, well, section A, section B, and section C. Each one has a shape. We work out the area of the shape um, and then combine those to give us the total distance traveled. So section A is a triangle, and that's going to, the sum that we're going to do is half times base times height. So that's half times 400 times three, which gives us 600 meters. Section B is a rectangle, and so that gives us base times height as the formula we would need. 300 times 3 is 900 meters. Section C is a triangle again, so half base times height gives us 150 meters. Um, when we combine those together, the total distance traveled comes out as expected at 1,650 meters, um, and that is an excellence level response. Okay. On to question two, um, we've got an adult and a child, um, their feet have sunk into soft sand, footprints are the same depth, um, even though there's a different area um, for both the adult and the child. Um, pressure is defined as force exerted divided by surface area, and so using this definition, we are asked to explain how it applies to the adult standing in the sand. So um, to do this, um, I would state the formula and make sure that I talk about each of those terms in the formula to try and give a full and complete answer. The weight force, F of the adult, um, is applied to the area, A, of the soles of their feet. That produces the pressure that creates depressions in the sand. That's the sinking into the sand. That's a, there's not much to that one, so it's just an achieved answer. Um, in, set, in question B, um, we've got the surface area of both the adult and child given and the adult's weight. And we're asked to show that the total pressure the adult exerts is 17,250 pascals. So again, we'll use the guess method. We're given the weight of the adult and the area, but it's only one of the adult's footprints. So we need to multiply that by two um, to give us 0 0.0400 meters squared. Our unknown in this case is pressure, and so we find uh, we look for our equation if we don't already know it, um, and that's going to be P equals F divided by A. We're going to substitute in the force and the area, and then solve using our calculators uh, to give us 17,250 pascals. Um, because there was two parts to that show question, the calculation itself and the identifying the the need to double the area, that would be a merit level response. All right, in part C, um, we need to explain how the footprints are the same depth, even though the mass of the child is smaller. And we've got to include pressure, surface area, and mass in our discussion. So the child has a smaller mass, and given the formula, weight force is equal to mass times gravitational field strength, the child also has a smaller weight than the adult. The child's feet are smaller than the adults. So the child has a smaller area. And again, stating this formula and using that to support our answer, with a smaller weight force and smaller area for the child and a larger weight force and larger area for the adult, um, the pressure can be equal. So if both for the, for the child, the F and A, the numerator and denominator, are smaller, that can give us the same pressure as if the force and area were larger in the case of the adult. And if the pressure is equal, then the depth of the footprints will be the same. Okay, and that would be an excellence level response. In 2D, um, we're told again that the adult and child's footprints are the same depth, and we're asked to calculate the mass of the child. There's quite a, a lot to this question, um, so feel free to pause or replay it um, to try and help your understanding. Um, the, we need the information on surface area. We haven't used the child's footprints um, surface area yet. We're gonna use that now. Um, we know that the pressure is 17,250 pascals, 
but the area this time, because we're working on it from the child, is 0 .1, 0 0.0150 multiplied by 2 um, for the child gives us an area of 0 0.03 meters squared. Our unknown at the first stage is the force of the child, and then we would use the force of the child to work out the mass of the child. So the equation we're going to use based on P, A, and F is pressure equals force divided by area. We need to rearrange this um, for, uh, for us to find the force. And so what I've done here is I've multiplied both sides of this equation by A. That gives us pressure times area is equal to force divided by area times area. Because we're both dividing and multiplying by area, we can cancel those out. And that gives us pressure times area equals force which I always tend to rewrite um, with the unknown on the left-hand side. So we can then substitute um, our pressure and area in and solve that to give us 517.5 newtons. I'm not going to round that answer yet um, because we're still not quite at the final answer, which is for mass. So then we're going to take that um, force and we are going to use um, some other information we've been given um, that G, uh, again, this is in the this is in the front of the exam booklet with your equ equations. Um, G is 10 newtons per kilogram. Um, and so with those two and our unknown of mass, we should be able to find the formula um, F equals mg. Um, and that's the weight force. That's why I've got the little W in subscript. Um, we rearrange that um, to, to, to rearrange that to find M. We need to divide both sides by G. That lets us cancel out the G on this side and gives us m is equal to f divided by g. And then we can substitute in our values, 517.5 divided by 10, which gives us 51.75 kilograms. Now, um, you're not marked off, you're not marked down for significant figures, but um, just to get into the right habits, um, looking at this question, the data in the question was um, arguably three significant figures, three significant figures, um, it could be, you could um, say that 690 might be two significant figures, that's fine. Um, you're not going to be marked down for it at level one, but I'm going to assume it's three significant figures. And so I would round my answer to 51.8 kilograms because the five um, is um, uh, the five after the seven um, would indicate that we round up. Remember, we would round up on five, six, seven, eight, or nine. Um, that would give us 51.8 kilograms. And there's a lot to that question, so that's why it's a, an excellence level response um, for the, the full and complete answer. All right, in part E, um, the adult's weight force does 21 joules of work on the sand. Calculate the distance the adult's feet sink into the sand. So our givens are energy, force that we've already got um, for the adult, and area that we've again already got. Now, remember, you're not always going to have to use everything you've been given. Our unknown is D, so then we're looking for an equation that links D to some of these givens that we've got. And we should be able to find um, that the equation is work done equals force times distance. Um, this can be a little bit confusing that the W is work done and it's referring to energy. That's something you're expected to know and uh, hopefully you already do. Um, we can rearrange that formula to find D. So to do that, we need to get D on its own. We're going to divide both sides by F, um, and then that lets us cancel out the Fs um, on this side to give us work done divided by force equals distance. And again, I rewrite that with the unknown on the left. We substitute the values in, 21 divided by 690, and that gives us um, a distance that will show up on your calculator probably is quite a long number. Um, we're going to write that, in this case, the 21 joules is the lowest number of significant figures that we've been given in the question. And so um, I would round that to two significant figures, which gives us a distance of 0 0.030 meters. And that would be a merit answer. Okay, that brings us to question three. Um, and we've got a parachutist with total mass of 63 kilograms jumping from a plane. We're asked to show that his uh, potential energy, gravitational potential energy, 3,500 meters above sea level is 2,205,000 joules. So again, um, we're going to use the guess method. Um, the givens are the mass, distance, and G, 
Uh, remember that's in the front of the exam book with the equations. Um, and our unknown is energy. Now the D in this case, because it's vertical, uh, we might consider it as height or H. Um, and our equation is EP equals MGH. I use a little P subscript just to indicate that that's potential energy or gravitational potential energy. We substitute our values in and solve, and it gives us the expected answer. Um, so because that's a show question, um, there's a reasonable bit to it. Um, that we're expected to pull out that G value, for example, um, and relate the distance to height. Um, that's a merit level response. In part B, uh, we're told they fall 450 meters in the first 9.49 seconds. Calculate the average speed during this time. So using the guess method, the given values are time and distance. The unknown is V. And so a nice easy formula there in the exam for us is V equals the change in distance over change in time. That's for average velocity. And so then we can just substitute and solve, giving us 47.4 meters per second. Um, that's a fairly simple uh, plug and play answer, and so that would just be an achieved level. In part C, um, we've got to explain the vertical motion of the parachutist immediately after jumping out of the plane before the parachute opens. Um, we're given three bullet points, and we should probably make sure that our answer targets each of these bullet points. In the exam, if you've got bullet points, I would tick each one off as you complete it to make sure you've done all of them before you leave the question. Um, now, I'm just going to point out that there's a couple of different variations to this answer, depending on whether you assume the parachutist has is, is at the very instant that they've jumped out the plane and haven't yet um, accelerated to any vertical velocity, or um, you could assume that the immediately is um, uh, slightly less strict and that they've jumped out of the plane and fallen some distance before um, you consider that situation. Um, as long as you um, explain what you're talking about and use the correct terms, it isn't going to matter which approach you take in terms of the uh, grade that you would get. Um, so I've assumed that the parachute has immediately jumped out of the plane um, and they haven't yet built up any vertical velocity. So it's the very instant that they have you know, left the plane. Um, so immediately after jumping out of the plane, the parachutist will have no vertical speed because they haven't had any time yet um, to accelerate. Um, there is a net force downwards um, due to their weight, um, and there's no vertical friction yet because they have zero vertical speed, meaning they're not falling through any air particles that would give them that um, friction or air resistance yet. Because weight is the only force acting on them, um, the force is unbalanced um, and they will accelerate um, with that value of weight acting on their mass. Um, from Newton's second law, we know that that unbalanced or net force acting on a mass will produce acceleration in that direction, i.e. downwards. And so the parachutist will accelerate downwards at a rate of 10 meters per second squared. Um, and that would be uh, an excellence level response. Now, I've put in this little link here, um, and I'll try and link that in the video as well, to a great little, I think it's about a 30 second simulation showing you what's going on there with free body diagrams acting on a ball as it falls vertically. And it's a really good way to help you understand what's going on with those forces. Um, in part D, oops, and I haven't obviously haven't animated that <laughs> um, energy value yet. Apologies for that. Um, so during the 450 meter fall, um, the parachutist gravitational potential energy was reduced by um, 283,500 joules. We're asked to calculate um, their downward speed at 450 meters, assuming the energy is, conser is conserved. Okay, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you another little formula that you can work out. Um, and once we've got that formula, these sorts of questions become really easy but you won't be given this exact formula in the exam, although you could work it out. So assuming energy is conserved, then that means that the potential gravita the gravitational potential energy is equal to the kinetic energy um, after the parachutist has changed a certain height or fallen a certain height. Because EP is mgh and ek is half mv squared, we can write that out as 
so. And then we're going to do a little bit of algebra to um, simplify that formula. So what I would do first is get rid of the fraction. Um, so if we multiply both sides by 2, then that gives us 2mgh equals mv squared. And then we've got m on both sides of the equation, so we can divide through by m to remove it completely, giving us 2gh is equal to v squared. Um, we're interested in v, um, so we're going to get rid of the little squared um, against the v by square rooting both sides of the formula. And that gives us the square root of 2gh is equal to v. And I'll rewrite that with v on the left-hand side. Now, this is a really nifty little formula that shows us that if we're ignoring a resistance, then the only thing that determines the velocity of an object or the speed of an object as it falls is the height through which it has fallen and the gravitational field strength, um, in this case, 10 um, on Earth. So... Um, using that equation and the values that we've been given, which is height um, and energy, and we actually realize here that the energy is irrelevant. Um, there are ways that we could use it, um, but uh, I'm going to use this little formula here that we've worked out. We've also got the value G of 10 newtons per kilogram. Um, our unknown is V. And so using that equation that I've just shown you how to arrive at, um, we can substitute. So G is 10 and H is 450 meters and solve. Remembering, be really careful when you do this on your calculator that you remember to do the square root. Common mistake is not square rooting um, the 2 times 10 times 450. And that gives us a velocity of 94 point blah 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 meters per second. Um, again, rounding that, I'm looking at the values here and uh, I would probably assume that the 450 is three significant figures. Um, and so I'm going to round my answer to three significant figures. You might say, well, the G is 10, but because G is a constant, we don't normally consider the value, the, the significant figures of a constant when rounding our answer. Um, that's all a little bit higher level, and you don't get penalized for your significant figures in level one. So um, it doesn't matter too much, but I've given my answer as velocity or speed as 94.9 meters per second. Um, and that's our answer to your question. Um, there's a fair bit going on there, um, and that is an excellence level response. Okay, I hope that's been helpful for you. Feel free to post any questions and um, I'll try and get to them uh, as I can.